Hello again and welcome. Uh, my name is Johan Gunnarsson. I work at the Division of External Relations at Lund University in the International Marketing and Recruitment team. And I am here today joined by my colleague with the same <laughs> family name, Daniel. <laughs> Hello, Daniel. Hello, guys. So even though I have the same family name as Johan, I am not his brother. So it's just <laughs> a very common family name in Sweden. But yes. My name is Daniel. I'm working in the same group as Johan. I'm working with international marketing and recruitment as well. I have a focus on, yeah, I guess you could call it like post-Soviet states usually, but I'm here today to answer your questions and help you guide you through the application process. And in the back end, we have our colleague, Timothy, as well, that will be answering questions um, while we're doing this webinar. Right. So, Tim, uh, you can't uh, see or hear him, but he will be there, rest assured, uh, answering your questions, because we have today, first of all, a PPT that we're going to go through with the information about applying to a master's uh, degree program at Lund University. But maybe you have questions, you're very eager to, to, to get an answer to your question, please use the Q&A. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand and or try to use the chat function in Zoom. We want you to use the Q&A, please. And Tim will be there to answer your questions in written form. Um, and after we finish the PPT, it, it's going to take around half an hour or so, I believe. Uh, me and Daniel will, will uh, take over and answer the questions live in the Q&A. But if you have something urgent or you can't stick around and wait for us to finish the PPT, please use the Q&A to ask questions to Tim, our colleague. And also, please remember that there is an upvote function. So if you look in the Q&A and you see a question that, oh, this is a question I really want to know the answer to, please upvote it rather than uh, typing your own question that it would be the same. So the upvote function is there in the Q&A and please use it uh, if applicable. Now, Daniel, um, should we get started with the PPT? I think we could, yes. It seems like the number of participants has dropped off a little mm -hmm. bit, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I have the PPT on my computer. I'm gonna share my screen. And we have a PPT about applying to a master's program at Lund University, study master's degree at Lund University in Sweden. So what's on the agenda for today? Well, first of all, some general information about master's programs at Lund University. We're going to talk about the different entry requirements we have in place uh, that must be met in order for us to consider your application. Very important, of course, right now, at uh, this point in time, the, ap the actual application, how to make an application, the various steps um, that people need to take in order to get their uh, applications properly assessed, evaluated, and hopefully we might be able to consider you for admission in the spring of uh, uh, next year. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about tuition fees uh, for those who have to pay tuition fees and also living expenses, which of course all people must be able to, um, uh, to handle. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about scholarships and funding opportunities for students. And also, of course, after this, we will have a, a pretty massive Q&A session. <laughs> but if you have a question, again, please don't wait. Uh, please don't delay. If you have a question right now and you urgently need to get a, a reply or an answer, please use the Q&A at any point and our colleague Tim at the back end will, will help you. Um, but yes, so let's get started. Uh, Daniel, would you like to tell us about master's programs at Lund University? Yes, so a lot of our quest well, the questions we were receiving at the moment from students are like, what is the first step in order to make an application? And the first step is definitely to find a degree program at a university. You can't make an application without knowing what you would like to study. So I would highly recommend you guys to find the degree program you're interested in on our website. And we offer about 130 different master's programs. It's different like programs, but also like it could be, for instance, our program in biology is basically one program, but there are many different subjects within that program. But there are 130 different master's programs. There's a wide range of subjects and each degree program has its own web page. And this is very important. Uh, so you need to go to a website and you need to find the program web page of the program you're interested in, because that's where you will find all the information you need in order to make an application. It might sound complicated, but it's really not. It's very simple to find on a web page, and we're going to show you how to do that. So the first step would be to find a degree program. 
And then the next question would be like, how do you find out if you're eligible for this specific program? And there are some general requirements when you make your application that you need to basically have sorted before you make your application. You must have a bachelor's degree because yeah, today we're talking about the master's program. We might want to highlight that as well. We have another session this afternoon for bachelors. So if you have any students here that are interested in doing a bachelor's program, you will have to well, join our colleagues this afternoon for the bachelor's session. But in order to reach the master's uh, requirements, you need to have a bachelor's degree. It has to be equivalent to a minimum of 180 ECTS, or you need to be in your final year of completing your bachelor's degree. So you can apply when in your in final year of studies of your bachelor's degree. You also need to submit what we call valid proof of your English language proficiency. And there's a lot of information about this on the website, but we will highlight it later on as well. You also need to check for country specific requirements. And when we talk about country in this specific um, setting here, we're not talking about your nationality. We don't care where you're from. We need to know where you have studied. So wherever you studied your bachelor's, you need to ch check the country specific requirements for that specific country uh, when you make your application, because there are different requirements depending on where you have studied. And all these details are also outlined on the universityadmissions.se website, which is also the website you use when you make your application. And we will make this crystal clear for you during this presentation, so no worries. And then besides the actual general requirements, there are also program specific requirements. And the program specific requirements are different depending on the program you're going to apply to. So most of our programs are what we call in-depth masters, which means that you need to have an academic background in a related field. Some of our programs are more flexible, but most of them require a degree in the same field. So you need to check that on the program specific webpage on our webpage. Uh, and you meet, must meet all the requirements for the program you apply for. We get a lot of questions like, I ha don't have this specific requirement. Is that still necessary? And unfortunately, in most situations, yes, it is. So you need to well meet all the requirements before you make your application. But we'll make that clear as well as we go along here today. Right. And when can you apply? Yes, do one. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> when can I apply for a master's studies? Well, now, uh, if you haven't already, uh, now is the time to apply. Um, we are open currently. We have been open for a while. Uh, we open in mid-October and we're going to stay open until January 16, 2023. So that is the very last date when you can either make a fresh application or add or remove programs from your current application. Um, uh, but after January 16, uh, your application is locked, basically, and you cannot change it. You cannot do anything. So that is the very last date. We don't necessarily recommend that you wait until the very last day um, that we're open to make your application. If you know what you want to apply to today, please make your application today. Uh, there's no point in waiting until January 16. But we want you to know that it is possible to make an application all until that uh, day. Um, and then, of course, there's a pretty long wait for you. We have, you know, lots of stuff happening, information in the in the spring, the admission results will be released. Um, you're going to apply for housing, apply for maybe scholarships, etc. We'll get to that later. And then the autumn 2023, it starts in early September. Well, I would say actually late August to early September, because not all programs have the same start date. But we do typically invite international students to join us here sometime in mid-August when we have the arrival day for international students joining us here. So please make plans to join us here physically in sometime in mid to late August of 2023, if you get an admission offer. So sometimes people say, well, I, I've heard that there are other application rounds, some programs might be open then, and we say no please do not wait or take a chance to use a different application round than this one that we're currently right in the middle of. If you want to join us here uh, and have a chance to join us here in the autumn of 2023, now is the time to make your application and do not wait. Um, do not wait beyond January 16, that is, because that is the actual firm deadline for making an application to Lund University. 
All right, so now we're going to tell you more like step by step how to make an actual application if you have not started yet, or if you maybe you have started and you made your application, but you haven't finished it yet. So uh, what should you do and when? Well, as Daniel told you before, uh, we have something called University Admissions.se, University Admissions in Sweden. So this is a national application portal that is used by all Swedish universities uh, for uh, when people make applications to learn, uh, or sorry, yeah, to learn, but also any other Swedish university. Um, so if you go to this website, universityadmissions.se, you're going to find all the programs available right now in the current application round, international degree programs taught uh, in English, of course. So you need to go there as a first stop and create an account. And this is very simple. You just sign up, you know, uh, you provide some personal information and contact email address, etc. And you create the account. It's pretty quick. It doesn't take more than a minute to sign up for an account, uh, according to my experience. So that is the very first, first thing you need to do. And we have some information related to this. Uh, first of all, it's only uh, uh, allowed to use one application account. Now, sometimes we have seen that students think, oh, if I create two accounts, then I have two chances to get admitted. But uh, of course, that's not how things work, because eventually the admissions officers working at University Admissions in Sweden, they're going to see that you have created multiple accounts and they're going to merge these accounts. And when they merge accounts, some information may get lost, such as the program you place at number one or application documents that you have provided. So this is very risky and don't do it. Please just have one account on university admissions in Sweden. If you have previously made an uh, application, maybe several years ago, and you don't remember the password or something like that, you can create a new account, but then you can ask university admissions in Sweden to merge with your old or tell them, look, I, I have an old account and I can't remember the password. You can just have one active application account. Uh, make sure that you're the only person who has access to the account, of course. Do not share the password or email address that you used when you signed up with anyone else. This is your personal account only. And also, please use an email address that you have access to uh, or an email account and that you, you will check the emails regularly on this account, because we have seen sometimes as students create a new email account and they make an application and then they don't check the emails that they get to this account because they think, well, I'm done. I've already made my application. I'm going to wait for the admission result. But this is the only chance we have to communicate with you through the, your email address that you have provided when you sign up for university admissions in Sweden. And also, uh, not just us, Lund University, also admissions officers working at uh, university admissions in Sweden. When they uh, assess your application and they may or may not find anything unusual or something that's missing, they will want to communicate this with you. And then they would contact you through your account and an email will end up in your email inbox saying you have a message from University of Missions in Sweden, please check. So it's important that you check your application account and the associated email account um, a couple of times per week, in my opinion, to see if there are any messages either from Lund University or from University of Missions in Sweden. All right, Daniel. Yes, so I'm going to tell you about the first deadline that's really important, and that would be the 16th January ded deadline, which is when you should have made your application. The digital application, while you have selected the programs you're interested in, that has to be made before 16th of January. And you can, as a matter of fact, apply up for up to four different master's programs in one application round, which is very nice. Uh, so you can apply for programs both at like Lund University, but it doesn't have to be all programs at Lund University you can also apply to other universities as well if you would like to. So you can apply for four different programs. It can be four programs at Lund University or four programs at four different universities. That's totally up to you guys. Uh, but the main thing here is like, don't forget that you need to apply for programs you are eligible for. And I can tell you as well that even if you would like to come to Lund, we have hundreds of applicants every year. If you are at all uncertain if you would be able to get into a program at Lund University. You can also apply to other universities in Sweden. There are other good schools, even though we consider ourselves to be best, obviously, because we're working here and we love it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you can make an application for other universities as well. Just remember, if you really would like to come to Lund, you will have to select us as your main priority uh, in Sweden. And we will talk more about that later on. 
But it could be good for you to know that even when I made my application to Lund, even though I knew that I would most likely be able to get in, I also applied to other universities in Sweden because that's a rational thing to do and that's perfectly fine. We, we don't really care about that. As long as you keep us as your main priority, we're fine. Um, so then you have to rank your programs. And this is very important as well. You need to do that before the 16th of January as well. And that is because you can only, only be admitted to one program. So the ranking is ridiculously important here. So if you would like to get into, let's say international marketing and, well, and brand management, let's say that's the program you would like to study in Sweden and Sedlund University, you need to keep that as your main priority. That needs to be number one on your list when you make your application. Um, and that's perfectly fine. As long as you keep it as your number one, don't keep it as your number two because you're not sure that you will get in. Because if you have it as your number two, you will definitely not get in because you can only be admitted to one program. The rest of the programs on your list will be eliminated from your application. So rank your choices, select the first program you really would like to study in Sweden as your main priority, and then the second and third and fourth and so forth. So it's very important. Um, and also, yeah, yeah, as I mentioned before, if you want to study at Lund University, we are in fact the most popular university in Sweden, you need to keep us as your number one priority. Otherwise you will not have a chance of studying here. Uh, it will also affect your chances of receiving a scholarship from Lund University. And a lot of people might think like that sounds a bit harsh and yeah, but it's, it's just a fact, it's reality. If you look at the statistics from the last couple of years, there's not a single scholarship that has been given to a second priority applicant. The only time that might happen if, if someone actually applied to the same faculty at Lund University or the same subject area at Lund University and you didn't get into your first priority, which was also at Lund University, you could still be considered for like uh, a scholarship for your second priority. And the reason for that is very simple. We have so many applicants. So why would the professor that is actually the one nominating students for a scholarship, if they have 10 to 15 really, really good applicants in their program, why would they select a scholarship application that actually were from a student that applied as like third priority or second priority? They, they wouldn't do that. They are also very interested in giving the chance to someone that's dedicated and not really interested in studying at their specific program. And that's the only reason why we tell people that if you want to have a scholarship from Lund University, you need to keep us as your main priority as well when you make your application. So keep that in mind as well. If you are scholarship dependent, this is very important. Yeah, I think also we might add here that all other Swedish universities, they have the same policy on this, basically. So oh, yes. if, if you'd rather go to a different university than Lund, we hope you don't. But if that's the case, then you should take that program at that university, put it as number one and hope to get a scholarship from their university or from that university, uh, because we're not going to be able to offer you a scholarship if you have us as second, third or, or even fourth choice. Yeah. Right. And then, so, yeah. Sorry, Daniel, Go ahead. Uh, I might continue. Uh, we have a second deadline also. This is sometimes a bit confusing for people because what is, there are two, why are there two deadlines and what deadline is for what exactly? So as Daniel just said, January 16 is the deadline for you to actually make your application online. So that is you create the account at University of Missions in Sweden, you select our programs, you arrange them in the way that you're comfortable with. Your your first choice must be your the one program that you really hope to get into the most, basically. The second choice, third choice, fourth choice, those are backup options. You are allowed to, to, to select more than one program, but you should treat them as, I mean, number two, three, four are basically your backup options. And number one, that is the program you really want to get into the most. But after January 16, you cannot change anything you've done online. So that is the application that you have, it's locked. But we do have a second deadline, which is February the 1st. So what do you need to do by February the 1st and no later than February the 1st? Well, first of all, you have to submit all your supporting documents. And that is all the transcript, your official uh, transcripts from your previous studies, and also a degree certificate or a diploma if you have been awarded a degree certificate or a diploma at that point. If you are in your final year, of course, you must get an officially issued document from your home university that confirms that you are currently in your final year of studies at this university, and hopefully you are expected to graduate before you, you join us here in the autumn of 2023. So that is very important. And of course, all of these documents have to be original 
documents. They have to be directly issued by your university to you, and most likely they will have either a stamp and or a signature um, in color. You also need to provide proof of English language proficiency. Now, of course, there are many different ways uh, as an applicant can prove their English language proficiency, such as an English test like IELTS or TOEFL. Um, but there are also other ways like previous university studies where you studied in English, uh, perhaps, or uh, even uh, upper secondary school merits. Uh, you studied in an English speaking country for upper secondary school, then you may get approved for English language proficiency. But there are many different ways you can get approved for English. Uh, we need you to provide some type of identification document. And now, most students would choose their passport if they have one at that point to just scan the passport and upload it to University of Missions in Sweden. So we know that you are who you say you are. Um, and if you don't have a passport yet, probably you should apply for one um, as soon as possible, because this is a process that can take uh, a while in certain countries. But if you don't have it, you may have a national ID card instead, and you may use that uh, together with your application. That is also okay. And finally, as I said previously, you must have, if you have not finished your studies yet, if you have not graduated from university, you're in your final year, you must get your uh, home university to issue a document confirming that you are in your final year and you are scheduled to graduate before you come to Sweden. Also, of course, as we have mentioned uh, in, in the beginning of this presentation, there are country-specific requirements for you. And these country-specific requirements, they are university admissions in Sweden requirements, one might say. They're not, they're not local Lund University requirements. It's more like the national level. So if you go to university admissions in Sweden website, you, you can find your country where you studied previously. Um, and as Daniel has mentioned, this is not about your nationality. It's, it is where you studied previously. So if I am Swedish, my nationality is Sweden, but I studied in the United States for my bachelor's, I need to follow the instructions for the United States. If I'm Chinese and I studied in Australia, I need to follow the, the rules for Australia. Of course, most people tend to have the same nationality here. I mean, I am Brazilian and I studied in Brazil, then I, then I choose Brazil. But please do go and visit the University of Admissions in Sweden website for country specific information about the country where you studied previously. So this is very important. You go there, you select the country where you studied previously, and you can read what, how can I become eligible for university studies in Sweden? Uh, and also what documents do I need to provide and in, in what format? Um, it is, for example, very, very common that students would need to translate their official documents unless they studied in English before. Uh, so if you studied in an English speaking country, of course, your official documents will already be in English. But in many, perhaps most other countries where the native language is not English, your university have, they have probably issued documents in the native language, in your country's language. And if that's the case, you need to provide both that and an official translation of those uh, very documents. Could also be that for some countries, they have very specific requirements for how, what the documents should look like and what they should contain, what information, for example, stamps or signatures, uh, et cetera, that may be required depending on the country specific uh, information that you can find on the University of Admissions in Sweden website. Now, moving on, Th those are kind of the general documents that all students, regardless of what program they intend to apply to, they need to submit that. So all of you need to submit that when you apply to a master's degree program at Lund University. But then, of course, as Daniel mentioned previously, we also have program specific documents that may, uh, may be needed. Now, I would say not all of our programs, but definitely most of our programs have requirements here for specific documents just for application to that particular program. So it could be, for example, what we refer to as a statement of purpose, which is kind of a personal statement or personal letter that you write. Uh, and sometimes programs, they would have uh, templates for this that you can download like a, a Word uh, document with a couple of questions or very clear instructions. Please write no more than 1,000 words about this or that. Um, or it could, they could just leave it up to the applicant themselves to, to try to figure out 
what to include, what type of information to include in a statement of purpose. They say, write a statement of uh, purpose, maximum 700 words or something like that. You need to find out for your program or programs what is needed here. Sometimes a CV is also required um, or a summary sheet, a summary sheet, which is basically also like a template that you can download from the program webpage. And there you need to fill out all the information that they require to that particular program. Occasionally, not very often, a recommendation letter um, would be required. Uh, a few programs have this requirement. Most do not, but a few do. And if they do have this requirement, you have to submit this recommendation letter according to their instructions. Now, in order to find out what documents your program or programs uh, want, you need to visit their uh, specific web page to find information. Okay, so this program, they require this, that, the other. Then you need to submit all those documents by the deadline, which is February the 1st, 2023. We have to point out or mention that sometimes programs might say you do not need to submit any extra documents when you apply to this program. They just want to look at your transcripts, basically. Um, and if that's the case, you don't need to and you shouldn't send any extra documents because they don't need that. Um, and again, some programs may have specific templates for either the statement of purpose or what we call uh, sometimes summary sheet, basically, which is a form that you need to fill out and you can download it from the program web page, but some do not. All right, Daniel. All right, so that was all about the like documents you need to send, but the 1st of February, there are also two other things you need to consider. <clears throat> so if you are a non-EU EEA citizen, you must pay an application fee. And this can't be waived. You, you actually unfortunately have to pay this application fee. It's written in Swedish law. <laughs> so you need to pay the fee to university admissions and that has to be done by the 1st of February. And if you don't pay this fee, your application will not be assessed. They will not look at it at all. Uh, so remember that you need to pay the fee before the 1st of February. If you're an EU or EEA citizen, uh, the fee is not for you at all. What you need to do instead is you need to submit proof of your EU citizenship. And this is usually handled by sending, well, just uploading a copy of your passport. That's the easiest way of doing it. Or a national ID card if you don't have a passport ready. But the passport is the easiest way. We can see that you're from Germany, for instance, and then there will be no problem at all. So that's the two things to consider here. Like the application fee is also deadline 1st February. And this deadline is strict. If you don't pay by 1st February, your application will not be considered. If you pay later, your application will be considered to be late. And since we are yeah, the most popular school in Sweden, we nearly never process any late applicants. So please, for the love of God, make your application and pay on time because otherwise you have no chance of getting admission. So remember that 1st of February, you have to pay the application fee, very important. And also, yeah, there are two deadlines. So the first deadline, 16th of January, it's just for your digital application. Make sure that you've selected your programs, that you've ranked them in the order you would like them. And of the 16th of January, you can't move your programs any longer. So you need to do that by the 16th of January. And then 1st of February, make sure that you've sent all the basic uh, documents and also all the program specific documents required for the programs you've applied to. Also, your English proficiency has to be sent by the state and you need to pay the application fee or prove that you're exempt. That has to be done on the 1st of February. So you have about two more weeks after you make your digital application to basically make the application complete. It's quite simple, even though it's a lot of information here today, but that's very important to remember. <laughs> Right. I, I think also, Daniel, we need to, because we, I so often get questions from students saying, well, I have, I'm going to take the IELTS test on February 15th and I will get the result in, in late February. Will that be okay? Well, unfortunately, such scenarios, uh, that would mean we can't process your application properly and in time. So we cannot recommend that. If you know that you cannot provide all of these required documents by February the 1st, um, I would actually say that you should probably consider postponing your application completely, because if if you cannot get a complete application in by February the 1st or supporting documents, um, then unfortunately, as Daniel said, we will probably not be able to process it and assess you 
um, and then you can't get an admission offer. So please make sure that you only continue with your application and pay the application fee or prove that you're exempt if you can actually complete it uh, uh, totally by February the 1st. Yes, and once your application has been provided to us, once you have completed your application, it will be assessed by admissions officers at the university admissions in Sweden, and then by the actual program staff. So university admissions in Sweden, they do like the general checking that you have your degree, that you have uh, the English proficiency and everything. That's not handled by us. It's like the national system that checks that for us. And then the actual program staff, the professors and teachers at the program will make the final selection based on the program specific documents or the program specific requirements, who they would like to admit to their specific program. And unfortunately, this takes quite a bit of time. And we know that that might be stressful and people might think like, why is this? And it's basically due to Swedish law. We need to treat everyone equally. And we are very strict and careful in when we make this like assessment of students. And that takes time. So the admission results will not be announced until the 30th of March, but all applicants will get their decision on the same day, on the same time, basically. So it takes time. We do apologize for that. But the good thing is that usually there's not a big problem with our application process in general. So just sit tight and relax. Everyone will get the decision at the same time. And admitted non-EU EA citizens uh, are required to pay tuition fees at Lund University. So the tuition fee varies quite a bit between different programs because different programs have different price tags because they are more or less costly to basically give to you guys in general. But you can see exactly the tuition fee at our website, at the program specific pages. Every single program specific page has a small portion of the page dedicated to the actual tuition fee. So you can see exactly what it will cost in Swedish, Swedish crowns, because we're in Sweden, you will have to pay in Swedish crowns. But that's usually some sort of translation to like euro or uh, dollars uh, that you can easily find as well. Uh, but you have to pay tuition fees and don't worry about that now more than the fact that you need to prepare in advance so that you know that you can afford the program or if you need a scholarship you need to prepare for that as well but otherwise I mean the payment is not handled now that will be closer to the summer so yeah no stress you don't have to pay in advance <laughs> uh, and also when we're talking about like the finances and everything I mean studying is not only the tuition fee you also need to have funds for your living costs. And I think we have a small breakdown of the budget here as well. So we have an example of a monthly student budget here. And you can see that we always start with the Swedish crown sec, and you need about nine to 10,000 Swedish crowns per month to basically survive in Sweden. Uh, and the euro equivalent would be 800 to 950 euros or 840 to 930 dollars for a, a normal student budget. It's, fairly expensive to live in Sweden. You can get by on less than this. I have to tell you, like a lot of our students are getting by on less, but you should definitely consider this budget and make sure that you can afford this. I mean, you don't have to spend all of this money, but it seems to be a very reasonable budget for a student in Sweden at the moment. And also all the costs here that you can see here, like the um, euro amount and the US dollar amount and the Swedish amount, I mean, that is, at the time when this PowerPoint was basically made, who knows what will happen in the next couple of months? Because I mean, the, the world market and the economy is going up and down all the time. So this is at the time of this PowerPoint only. I mean, that might have changed by the time you're actually arriving in Lund, but it's a reasonable budget to have. So it's a good, good number. And also, yes, important to know, uh, if you're, from outside of the European Union, if you're a non-EU EEA citizen, you must have the funding for living costs for one year before you make your application for a residence permit. And you need to have that money in a bank account that's in your own name. It can't be a shared account. It can't be a bank account. It's quite common in some countries that you might have a bank account that is shared with your parents or some, some other like guardian. <laughs> <clears throat> guardian angel but the fact of the matter is like when you actually make your application for the residence permit you need to have your own bank account 
And you need to have enough funds in that bank account to prove that you can support your living costs in Sweden for 12 months, so one year. That's very important. So don't use a shared account because that would just delay your application. Make sure that the account is yours and the money is readily available to you. And then you will have no problems with your residence permit application. Uh, EU and EEA citizens, you are actually not required to show any funding requirements. You don't have to show that you have money to support yourself, but obviously it's strongly recommended for you guys as well to make sure that you have enough money to support yourself in Sweden, but you don't, <clears throat> you don't need to show that, sorry. You don't need to show that to anyone uh, before you arrive because you have the right of free movement over the borders within the European Union. So you're allowed to just show up. You don't have to show it, but for non-EU EEA citizens, you must think about that now. You need to make sure that you have funds not only for the tuition fee, but also for the living costs. And you need to prepare that in advance. Yes. Right. So you want. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So related to this information, of course, uh, money, money matters. Uh, very important for all of us, regardless where we come from. Um, we're going to talk a bit about scholarship and other funding options at this point in the presentation. Now, Daniel has very helpfully explained uh, what you need in terms of your monthly budget uh, as a student here in Learned or in Sweden in general, and also um, how much you need in your personal bank account before you can get uh, your residence permit application approved if you need to apply for a residence permit. So there are some ways to have uh, opportunities to fund uh, your studies here and learn. Uh, if you're a non-EU student and you need to pay tuition fees to study in Sweden, there are some uh, scholarship opportunities that you can apply to. Um, first of all, our local scholarship program in Lund, just for Lund University, is called the Lund University Global Scholarship Program. And we invite eligible students to apply for this in early February. So after the, you remember the deadline we have for documents and payment of the uh, application fee, I'm sorry, uh, on February the 1st, after that, on I don't know, we don't have an exact date yet, if it's February the 2nd or 3rd, somewhere around that, early February anyway, we will open the Lund University Global Scholarship portal where eligible students will be invited to make an application for a scholarship at Lund University. Now, this is a, a merit-based scholarship. It's not a needs-based scholarship, it's merit-based. It's based on your motivation to study and learn, basically. And we also ask students to apply for this particular scholarship program to tell us how much they would need to fund their, fund their uh, tuition fee expenses here. It could be that you just need, maybe you have some savings, you can pay like 50% of the tuition fee, no problem, by yourself. Then you can ask for a 50% scholarship to cover the rest or if you need 75%, sometimes even up to 90 or even 100% occasionally can be awarded to applicants. Uh, so, but this is, I mean, let's be honest here, not all students can get the scholarship. We have, I believe, between 15 and 20 million, Daniel, typically Swedish krona per year that we award for the Learned University Global Scholarship divided among 130 master's degree programs. So you can imagine that they're uh, there will be almost one full scholarship per program, but not much more than that. But it depends a little bit on the, the faculties themselves and how they choose to divide the scholarship money that they, they get each year in between their own uh, program offerings, of course. Then, depending on your nationality, uh, the Swedish Institute... Uh, which is a national organization for the promotion of Sweden, they also have uh, a scholarship program that is quite generous. The Swedish Institute Scholarship for Global Professionals, I believe it's called the full name. And it's awarded uh, to uh, citizens from a bit more than 40 different countries around the world, uh, developing countries. And if you have the right profile and the right background, uh, you may make an application for the Swedish Institute Scholarship as well. And please do apply to both of these programs if you're eligible. I mean, there, there is no, uh, there's nothing that says you can only apply to one of them. Uh, you can apply to both if you want to and need to. Um, and also, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Swedish Institute Scholarship, they open for application in early February. Um, I just want to point out, though, that this process is not in the control of Lund University. It's, it's between you, the applicant, and Swedish Institute. So if you have lots of questions about the Swedish Institute Scholarship, please direct them towards the Swedish Institute and not Lund University. 
So yeah, those two opportunities exist. There are some other funding opportunities for students, depending on where you come from and where you're a citizen of a country, of course, as well. Um, for example, country-specific scholarship, what does that mean? Well, it means that citizens from certain countries around the world, um, you can go to our website to find out uh, which countries are involved here. They have funding opportunities through their own governments, usually, uh, where they can apply for a scholarship through, uh, with funding through their own government. They can also apply to Lund University Global Scholarship and possibly the Swedish Institute Scholarship. So some students, depending on where they come from, they can apply to multiple uh, scholarship uh, programs at the same time. Um, there are some other uh, opportunities for students. Certain countries can, can get uh, student bank loans and grants from their home countries. Uh, I'm afraid I we cannot offer you any bank loans or grant in Sweden. Uh, that uh, we are not allowed to 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 give that to international students before they have, uh, I guess, permanent residence in Sweden and and a relationship with a bank or um, other funding agency in Sweden. So. Right now, in, when you're applying from your home country, you're going to have to uh, rely on such services in your own home country if they have uh, a kind of a, a loan or a grant system for students going abroad. But it's very important, of course, that you figure all these things out and don't wait until the last moment, because eventually, hopefully, you're going to get an admission offer. And then we're going to send you a tuition fee invoice um, that has to be paid before the summer of, of 2023. And th at that point, it's way too late to figure out what your funding opportunities are. So this is something you really need to look into now if you haven't done so already to make sure that you have a plan A, a plan B, and maybe even a plan C to to be able to su successfully join us here next autumn all right daniel <laughs> shall we summarize <laughs> yes I, I really love this picture actually because that's i guess that's how you're feeling at the moment we do apologize it is a lot of information i mean and we're also talking fairly quickly we know that just because we want to reach the like q a instead so that you can actually ask questions to us but we have a couple of tips here for a successful application <clears throat> so one thing you have to do, which is quite obvious, I mean, you need to make sure that you are meeting all the entry requirements before you apply. It makes your life easier, it makes our life a lot easier as well. Uh, so make sure that you are um, meeting all the entry requirements before you make your application. And you just check this on our website. You check it on this program specific web page. Just read everything. There's a specific section about the actual requirements that you need to fulfill. Just read that like, yeah, really carefully and you will be fine. You also need to check the country specific pages and as we said before this is where you made your app well where you studied before this is a country where you need to check the country specific requirements and it's really important because there are different requirements when it comes to both like translating translation of your documents even if you have translated your documents you will still have to send them sometimes well i would say most times you need to send them in the original language as well and they need to prov be provided in a certain way for certain countries so just read this it's not that complicated, it's just that you need to be aware of it. So read it and just follow the guidelines and you will be fine with that one as well. So ensure that you have an accepted proof of English proficiency or take the test as soon as possible. So IELTS, TOEFL, there's a few Cambridge tests that's available as well. But if you don't have that, check if you have English from your previous studies, because that's also a way to show that you have an acceptable level of English proficiency. And it's not that complicated, really. It's just that you need to make it happen and have it done by the 1st of February. Um, right. I'm going to jump in yep. just very quickly here with English language <laughs> proficiency. Because some students or quite a lot of students need to take an English test uh, to prove their English proficiency. And we've been talking about IELTS and TOEFL and Daniel mentioned Cambridge. There's also something called Pearson Academic, if I'm not mistaken. But we get a lot of questions from applicants about Duolingo. Do you accept Duolingo uh, as proof of English? And I can just tell you here and now, no. That is not accepted by University of Missions in Sweden or by Lund University as proof of English. So Duolingo, I'm afraid, is not possible to use to prove your English. I'm, I'm sorry if I jumped in, Daniel. I just wanted to get that <laughs> comment about Duolingo in there. That's perfectly fine. I think Duolingo is an amazing way of learning a language. That's perfectly fine. But unfortunately, you can't use it to prove your English proficiency. But if you feel that you would like to practice your 
proficiency in English or any other language, maybe you would like to learn a bit of Swedish before you arrive, then Duolingo is absolutely fantastic. So you should definitely try it out. It's not a marketing for them, but I mean, yes, we know that Duolingo is a thing, but you can't use it to prove your proficiency. That's for sure. And uh, also, yes, make sure that you have ranked the programs in the order you would like so that you have the most wanted program as your main priority. And you need to do that before the 16th of January deadline. And I think the fifth one here, yes, pay the application fee or prove that you're exempt, that you're an EU EA citizen and do that as soon as possible. Because don't wait. I mean, if you have all your documents ready, if you know that you're going to have everything ready, if you know that you're going to make your application, don't wait until the 1st of February. The earlier you pay or the earlier you prove your exemption, the earlier we can start looking at your documents and the earlier you might be, um, well, we might find something wrong with your documentation, for instance. If that happens before the deadline, you will have time to fix that problem. So I would highly encourage everyone to prove that you're exempt or pay the application fee as soon as you know that you will be able to make a successful application. That's for sure. Like as soon as possible, pay the application fee. It will help. Uh, organize your official documents and submit these easy, well, at least as soon as possible as well, early on. I mean, there's no need to wait until the 1st of February. If you have your documents ready now, provide them to us now and pay the application fee because yeah, then we have more time to process them. And also make sure that you try to basically organize all your official documents as soon as possible because you might find out when you're checking your documents that, oh dear Lord, this document here is only in the original language. Should that also be translated? And it's way better to find that out now than finding it out on the last of January, because you might not have time to get it translated and submitted on time. So make sure that you prepare the documents as soon as possible. It will help it help you tremendously. And also, I mean, any questions you might have, it's better that you have them now and you ask them to us as soon as possible so that we can help guide you as well than finding it out in late January, because there might not be enough time for you to make your application complete by that time. And also prepare all program specific documents according to the instructions on our website. And it's not for everyone, but there are some programs that Joanne mentioned before, they have specific templates that you need to fill out. Use those templates. I mean, if there's a template on our website for a specific program, you need to follow that template. I can tell you straight away that these programs that have these specific templates, they have so many applicants that a student that uses their own template might not be considered at all for admission. You need to use a template on the website in order to make sure that you have all the necessary information when you make your application. So read these instructions for each specific program very carefully and just follow the instructions. It, there's not like a lot of complicated stuff going on, but you just need to make sure that you're providing the right documents. And you should be fine as well, no worries. <laughs> right, and don't make any assumptions here. I mean, if you're applying to multiple programs, applying to more than one program, if you follow the instructions for program number one, please do not assume that program number two will have exactly the same requirements for your special documents, because different programs in Lund have different requirements here. And if you apply to more than one program, well, first of all, you need to figure out what applies for that program, but also if you apply program number two, three, and maybe even four, they may have slightly different instructions for you here. So if you want to be able to be considered for all of these programs, I mean, in the end, you can just get one offer, but we have to look, all the programs you apply to have to look at your application. And you need to follow the instructions for each and every program with regard to program specific documents. Yes, and one thing when it comes to program specific documents, quite a few programs require a statement of purpose. You will never be admitted if you write like a generic statement of purpose for all four programs you're applying to. You need to write one individual statement of purpose per program. You need to convince us that you are motivated for this specific program. So the motivation letter or statement of purpose or letter of intent, whatever you would like to call it, it has to be tailored towards the specific program you're applying to. So if you're applying to several different programs, you need to write one per program and really highlight why you would be a perfect match for their program. Um, and also, yeah, the application fee and ensure that all documents arrive, that has to be done before the 1st of February. That's the deadline for the documentation. So make sure that you reach that deadline, that you do send everything before the 1st of February. 
And yeah, stick to the deadlines. They are strict. We're a very popular university. We have hundreds, even thousands of applicants for some programs. So make sure that you stick to the deadlines. If you are not within the deadlines, your application will be considered late and we never process late applications. Um, and also check your university admissions in Sweden account and your email regularly. As Johan told you, you should use an email address when you set up your account that you actually check regularly. Or if you set up a new email account because you are afraid that we will spam you or whatever, <clears throat> that's perfectly fine. I do understand why people would do that. But then for the love of God, check that email regularly because we will send information if something's wrong with your application. So check that email regularly. We will also invite students to make a scholarship application, for instance. You might want to have that invitation sent to you. So check the email regularly and you should be fine. All right, so that's a lot of information that we have gone through. I estimated that it would take a half an hour to go through this PPT. It took 50 minutes, so I was wrong, <laughs> clearly. But now we can concentrate on the Q&A. We have a lot of questions here that, I mean, I know that Tim has been working hard at the back end to help you with your questions, but some of them may be quicker, easier to handle orally. So now uh, Daniel and I will actually stop sharing our screen and uh, go through to the Q&A and handle your questions here uh, one by one. Now, I want to remind you, everyone, that we have the so-called upvote function. If you scroll through the Q&A and you find a question there that some other student has been asking and you think, oh, this is a good question, I want to know the answer uh, to this question, uh, please use the upvote function rather than to uh, write your, your own uh, question that is basically the same content-wise. Um, so we're going to check now uh, in the, oops, I, I have sorted the questions according to most upvotes. That sounds like a very interesting yeah, thing. Oops, <laughs> that's never a good thing when you have a woman. No, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Kiara Jade Pasagad uh, is asking, do companies in Sweden offer paid working student jobs? I, in Germany, you can work as a student at uh, Allianz, Siemens, etc. Um, well, Kiara, that's a very good question. Uh, it could happen, of course. I mean, it, first of all, I just want to explain that if getting a, if you're a full-time student in Sweden, you are allowed to work part-time. So that's completely legal to get a part-time job in Sweden. Now, some companies might be more willing than others to, to hire students, uh, student workers, or even international students who may or may not be fluent in the Swedish language. So it's not like all companies there's not a one size fits all approach to this. Some companies may be willing to do it. Some companies are less willing to do it. Um, I, I know you want to probably try to estimate your chances of, of getting a part-time job before you come here. And it's very difficult to say. Um, some students will be able to get a part-time job and some will not. And some will find, probably quite a lot of you will find that, oh, this program, uh, this master program is very intense. It requires a lot of work. Um, even during my so-called free time, I need to, you know, there are so many texts, so many books I need to, to go through, so many discussions I need to have with my classmates, that you may not have as much free time as you expect uh, when you actually come here and join the, the, the program. We have to be realistic, though. Um, it is not exactly easy uh, to get a part-time job in Sweden, because there's a lot of competition for part-time jobs. And you may or may not be successful here. So I know it's not a good answer, but the answer is it depends. Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Uh, but also, I'm, I'm, I just want to point out here for all that are now still joining us here, that in the Q&A, you can also see everything that Tim has already been answering. Just want to point that out. Like, there are different, like, tabs that you can see. So we are now going to answer, like, yeah, the question that Tim has not already uh, addressed before, but there are a couple of the questions that are already answered. So I just would highlight that for everyone joining us today, that you can also look at the answered questions already. But then I'm going to jump into a question here that is actually not on the um, most uploaded list, but that's because I saw a question here that I know we should potentially just spend a minute uh, to address. And that is, we have a student here asking, if you're a student from Sweden, do we have to send in all the general documents or can you see it all in LADOC? That's a very good question because we do have a lot of Swedish students applying as well. So I'm just going to quickly highlight that if you're a Swedish student, if you've been studying in Sweden, 
the things that we can see from your previous like studies is basically your transcripts, your degrees, everything like that will be in Lodoc. If you study at a Swedish university, we can basically see every course you've been taking with, within Sweden. That, you don't have to provide us with any like transcripts or anything, that's fine. However, all other documents has to be provided, all the program specific documents. You need to write a statement of purposes. If there's recommendation letters, you need to provide us with those. If there are any other specific documents required, you need to provide us with those documents. Because a lot of Swedish students assume that when you're applying for an international master's program, it's like applying to a bachelor's or anything else. And usually you don't have to provide any documents, but now you're competing with the rest of the world, which means that you really need to provide us with the statement of purpose, the recommendation letters, everything else, just like if you were an international applicant, but you don't have to do anything about the transcript because we can see those in Lodok already. So that's it, I think. There are a few Swedish here, so yeah. Let's move on with international questions. All right. Thank you, Daniel. So we have Martin, an uploaded comment. As students from the EU EEA country, are we eligible for any scholarships or income to help with our funding, which are perhaps available to us earlier than 12 months after moving to Sweden? I don't, I'm not so sure what you mean by that, Martin. Um, but I, what I can say is that there, are, as far as I know, there are no uh, Swedish subsidies or scholarships available to EU EEA students, I believe, uh, in most cases. So funding must uh, come from, from the student, him or herself, potentially with the help of a funding agency or a funding body in your own home country. I, I'm mentioning this because Swedish students who are studying abroad in another country, they can typically borrow money from a Swedish government agency that handles student loans, basically. So if I, I'm Swedish, I wanna study in Germany, I can ask them for a student loan to help me with my living expenses. Now, depending on the country where you come from, I don't know, but if it's EU, EA, there may be something similar. So that's all I can tell you at this point in time. Of course, you're welcome to take a part-time job when you come here, um, but before that, there are no, there are no funding agencies that would help non-Swedish students uh, join us here. And I think like, yeah, we're talking about that as well. I know that for instance, Denmark, they have a similar system to Sweden with like student loans. So they can definitely come and study at Swedish universities with their loans from their home country. And I think Germany has something like that as well. Or that could even be like private loans. So yeah, um, you can definitely use those funding schemes when you come to Sweden, but yeah, we don't have anything in Sweden helping uh, European students, unfortunately. Uh, we have a question here about like proof of English proficiency. If my degree has an English subject, would that suffice? Uh, and, and if yes, how many units uh, do you require? I would say like for the English proficiency requirements and previous studies, in most situations, you need to have at least 60 ECTS or a complete degree studied in English. Uh, it's highlighted on the university admissions website. You need to read the English proficiency requirement on the um, university admissions but that's the website because there are a lot of exemptions to be honest with you guys. It depends on the country you studied at or the type of university you studied at, but usually you are required a minimum of 60 ECTS or for some countries, a full degree in English language. So you need to figure that out by looking at the webpage, but one specific like English subject course will not help you, unfortunately. You need more than that, that's for sure. All right. So Saskia is asking, if, if one of my degree choices asks for a statement of purpose, but one doesn't, is it possible to upload documents for specific choices, uh, or will all the documents always be seen by all the universities I applied to? Uh, Saskia, yes. <laughs> I mean, we can see all the documents that you have uploaded to university admissions in Sweden. But of course, our programs are only ever interested in the documents that are relevant for them. So if you say apply to a different university as well, a different program, and you submit those documents to them, our program uh, staff who evaluate your application will not care about that. I mean, that's only natural. But just try to name your documents in a way that makes it easy for our program staff members to, to find them uh, on your application account. A top tip here would be the statement of purpose. Don't use the same statement of purpose for four different programs and just change the program mm -hmm. name. Because yes, we can see the other statement of purposes as well. So, uh, I mean, you need to make sure that the statement of purpose you write is unique for each and every program because we can see all the other documents as well. And if you are going to select between like 
who is motivated or not. I mean, if you have a student that wrote the exact same statement for four different programs and just changed the program name, you're not that motivated to get into this specific program. So that's a high top tip there for you guys. <laughs> All right. So Nita is asking, is there any possibility to be listed in the waiting list uh, in the admission results? For example, probably someone who, cannot be, uh, who accepted cannot continue the program due to fund problems, so other people could change him or her slots in the program. Nita, yes, we do have a waiting list system. So if you are, if you make your application according to the rules and recommendations and information, um, and, and the program is full, um, they, they, you are eligible for the program, but it's full, so they can put you on a waiting list. And then sometimes what happens is that some students may drop out who are admitted and they can potentially invite reserve listed students to join instead. Um, but of course, it's always better to get a straight admission offer, <laughs> in my opinion, because we can never know or estimate someone's chances if they're on the waiting list, waiting number 27. Will I get admitted or not eventually? Very hard to say. Also, a lot of our programs have been running for a long time. They know that if they admit 100 students, 20 will drop out. So sometimes we take an over intake. We know that we have 80 places, but we admit 100 students because we might lose 20. So even if you're reserve number one, it doesn't exactly mean that just because one student dropped out, that you will be offered the next position because there might be an over intake at each program as well. That could be something to keep in mind. And we get that question a lot like, oh, I'm so close. I'm number three on the reserve list. That might be 23 because we are not stupid. We are, yeah, quite quite clever people working at our programs. They might have an over intake just to make sure that we don't have to call reserves as well. So, but there's definitely a chance because some programs do not use the system, but others do. So there's a question here from Anele or something. I don't, I hope I don't butcher your name. I do apologize. For program specific requirements, uh, for instance, for sociology, uh, that you might have like, uh, well, requirement that you need to have a degree in sociology, social anthropology or equivalent. How can you find out if the studies you have taken is equivalent? Like, are there any exemptions from this requirement or can you just email the program? And this is a very good question because yes, we do have that little note of you should have studied something or something equivalent. And equivalent is very tricky for us to answer as well sometimes. I mean, it depends. So if you think that you might reach this like requirement, what I would highly recommend you to do is contact the program coordinator. They have their email addresses on the program specific web pages. Just send them an email, tell them what you've studied and ask them if they would consider that to be equivalent. Uh, because if they say that it's equivalent, then yes, you can make your application. If they say that, no, I'm sorry, sociology cannot be equivalent to psychology, for instance, because get that question a lot then you know you can't apply for the psychology program with a sociology degree. Um, so, but you should definitely contact the program. They are the only ones that can tell you if that would be considered equivalent or not. Right. So Christina, Elena, Albus, good morning. I have a small question. I'm an international bachelor student I learned. At the Swedish, uh, Swedish admission, I already have documents for my bachelor's application. I was wondering if I should upload new documents like transcript and degree certificate, CV or documents that have changed with the new date. Um, yes, you should definitely update your documents that are, I mean, your. we can see, like Daniel said before, we can see what you have studied in the courses or the program that you're currently enrolled in. So that's fine. But most likely the master's degree program that you're applying to, they have different requirements than when you applied for a bachelor's degree. They may, for example, require a CV or a statement of purpose, maybe even a recommendation letter. So you need to find out all those program specific documents for the master's degree that you're applying to, and you have to upload or submit those documents now, because that, those documents will not be the same, definitely, as when you applied for a bachelor's degree studies. Also, one top tip here as well. If you are currently in the Swedish application well, system doing your bachelor's, you also have to make sure that, because then you probably have a Swedish personal identity number by now, make sure that that number is updated for your university admissions account as well, so that they can easily basically just drag in your transcripts from the LODOC system, like the actual student register system in Sweden to your application. So just contact the admissions office or the university admissions staff and tell them your new Swedish personal identity number and they will update that for you. But please do that as well. It will make everything easier for you. So we have one here. Uh, 
face asking me about i'm from brazil and i'm doing the city i think tim oh yeah tim, uh, tim is answering that. That. Yeah, <laughs> let's skip that one that's true yeah. i saw that now <laughs> so elisa i'm planning to apply uh, for master's program in media communication but i don't have any media related studies a degree in my previous study however i have professional experience as a journalist for more than eight years is it possible for me to apply to the program would it be considered uh, for the selection committees this is a very good question. I get that every single year. I have a lot of students applying uh, that might be engineers, for instance. They have studied, let's say, engineering, but they've been working as a manager for a long time. So they have management experience, they have business experience, and they ask that, can I do business programs at the university? And it is tricky to, to say because, I mean, to be honest with you guys, we do, I mean, understand that if you have, well, you've worked in a certain specific subject area for a very long time, you have a very good knowledge of that area. But in most situations, your work experience will not matter when you make an application. Uh, we need you to have um, a similar background from your studies. Some programs do consider work experience. So I would recommend you to contact a specific program you would like to apply to and ask. But I mean, if you have a completely different background when it comes to like your academic degree in your bachelor's, it's highly unlikely that you would be eligible, but I would still recommend you to contact the program and ask, because some programs do think that like work experience can, at least for some part, you know, uh, stuff is. So you should definitely contact them, but in most situations, no, it will not help with the work experience, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, that's a very relevant question because we do get that quite often. Um, Noemi Faure is asking, is it uh, is a written and stamp confirmation from my home university certificate that I did my bachelor in English sufficient as English proof? Uh, Noemi, it depends on where you studied. If you did study, for example, in the European Union at university here where you where you took your courses in English and this can be confirmed by the, the home university, then that should be enough. But it, if it was from an outside of the European Union in a in a in a country that is non English speaking, that is not going to be enough because then it would have to say so on your official transcript or degree certificate that this program was taught completely in English. An extra document confirming that you know uh, someone says, "Oh yes, he or she took her degree completely in English," will not uh, suffice uh, if that's the case. It has to be uh, written or clearly printed on your transcript and or degree certificate. Thank you very an interesting question. If I meet all the requirements, what are the chances of acceptance? Is there a limit per degree for the number of students? This is really, really cool. I do understand that all students have this question, like what are my chances of getting admission to Lund University or this specific program? It's very difficult for us to, to answer. I mean, it depends on the program. There are some programs that have like 1800 applicants and about 60 places in that specific program. So, I mean, even if you're eligible, always so tricky to say that, yes, you could also be admitted to the program because it all depends on your grade point average, how good you wrote your statement of purpose. There are other factors as well. So it's almost impossible for us to tell you that, yes, I mean, we don't have that many programs where, I mean, if you're just eligible, you will be admitted. It doesn't really work like that because we're way too popular. So there's always a selection made. We will select the most talented students we can find every single year to each specific program. And there's a limit. We are not a business driven university. We do not make a profit. We are non-profit. We are not allowed to make a profit from tuition fees, for instance. Everything a student has paid for his or her education has to go back into the education. We are not allowed to use the money for anything else. And we don't need more money. We are not business driven in any way. So we can have a fixed limit. If we think that we can train 10 or 60 students well in a specific program, that's the only thing that matters to us. We will only set the number of admitted students based on what we think that we can basically do well we want to perform, we want to give our students the best possible way of having a successful like career afterwards. So if we think that we can train 10 students, we will take in 10 students. If we think that we can train 60 students with a very good quality, we will do 60 students. But even if we could get like 200 talented students, we are not business driven. We are not going to increase the number of places in a program to get 200 in, even if you can pay or whatever. 
that's not of interest to us. So there is a fixed uh, number of places in each and every program. Also, sometimes let's say that we have 25 places, but we can only find 20 students that we find enough, well talented enough. We can also lower the uh, number of students that we actually take in. We might end up with only 20 students then because it's all about quality. We are a top university. We would like to remain it like that. And usually it's not a problem. We have so many applicants. So we can easily fill our programs probably two times, three times over for some programs without a doubt because there are so many good students applying. But if you want to, there's official statistics in Sweden. Just Google statistics UHR, statistics UHR Sweden, and you can find it. It will be in Swedish, but you can make up your own judgment if you want. Like how many applicants do they have? How many students do they admit? That's available to everyone to see. So you can do that if you want to. All right. So Selena is asking, on University of Michigan, Sweden, it's, it's stated that you can show your English proficiency by showing your certificate from high school, uh, for example, from Germany. So I just have to upload this document. Uh, yeah, that is correct. I mean, if, if you're applying to a master's degree, we want to see your bachelor's level merits, first and foremost. But if you plan to use your high school merits or upper secondary school merits to prove your English language proficiency, then those documents have to be provided as well. So if you intend to use your high school or upper secondary school merits to prove your English, those documents have to be provided in the correct way as well. I think the first question here is something that maybe you can answer, Johan, about Sri Lanka. Uh, like if you have a bachelor's of three years and a postgrad diploma of one year, would that match the four academic years required for Sri Lanka? I know that you... Uh, well, I was actually looking at uh, Sri Lanka the other day, and yeah. uh, there is rather specific requirements. They have changed it as of 17th October 2022. For entry to a master's yeah. program, the minimum requirement is a four-year bachelor's degree or a bachelor's degree followed by a master's degree, four years of study in total. Uh, so the postgraduate diploma that you're referring to, Malita, it must be a master's degree. Uh, as far as I can tell, and I can send the link to you in uh, here. Please check. So Wei Jie Huang, uh, my documents are in English, but my university only has official stamps in my country's language. Should I transfer them by a certified translation company? Well, if, 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 if these documents were issued by your home university and they use their maybe Chinese language stamp, that's, that's totally fine. No problem whatsoever. But wait, here, please make sure that you submit. If I'm just assuming here that you have Chinese language documents based on your name, please submit the original documents in the in Chinese language and also the English language documents. And if they were all issued directly by your home university, that's totally fine. You don't need to get an additional translation doc. No, and I mean, it's the same for like the countries I'm working with, like the post Soviet ones, like in Ukraine and also like in Russia, you can easily. Ukrainian transcript, but also the translated one, like the English one from the university. But the stamp will most likely be in either Russian or Ukrainian of both these documents. And that's the way it's supposed to be because they have verified that this is official from our university. I mean, that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about the stamps. They can be in the original language. That's how we expect them to be, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so we have Samuel. Okay, so I'm in Ghana in the process of reviewing my passport renewing i think you want to say can i use the details of my expired passport to apply while i go on with the new renewal, renewal process uh yes that should be possible i mean at this point we just want to make sure that we can see that okay so this person is who he says he is the names match in the passport and on your official document so we know that it's the same person so if it has actually expired and you're in the in the process of renewing it doesn't matter um so yeah that was quick one and yeah. you say you have se several degrees you have one hnd in science <laughs> laboratory technology and bachelor of science in medical laboratory technology will it be advisable to apply with both certificates i would say so yes i mean all academic merits that you have currently um please submit all of them of course the bachelor's degree uh, the finished bachelor's degree will be the most in important one for you but also if you have additional merits that uh, may or may actually help your application or boost your chances. So the final question is, after downloading the program summary sheet, do I still 
have to add all the attached documents through scan. Um, yes, uh, these documents, you, if you talk about the summary sheet, you download it, maybe it's in a, a, a Microsoft uh, Word format, you fill out the document on your computer, then you save it as a PDF and you upload it to the University of Michigan of Sweden account. So the documents need to be provided to University of Michigan. And I believe, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, all documents provided to University of Michigan of Sweden, have, they have to be PDF, right? Uh, or do they now accept other formats as well? I'm pretty confident it has to be PDF, like the web standard. So yeah, it has to be PDF. Or at yeah. least, I mean, if, as long as you do provide them as PDF, you will be fine. So I would highly recommend yeah. you to, to send PDFs because then we know that it will work. Sometimes we do get students that have been able to upload pro well, documents that we can't read. That actually happens every single year that we get like, it could be corrupted documents as well, that they were corrupted before they were uploaded. Um, but yes, use PDF, it's a very good format for this. Uh, Nono here is asking like, does, uh, is it required for students to write statement of purpose for each course in the rankings like program one, two, three? And yes, they should be individual, they should be tailored. Uh, we have a question before, like, how do you write like a good motivation letter? Like, the most important thing is that the letter should state like your interest in this program in our university, maybe in Sweden, like, and also like why you would become a very good student in this specific program. So they have to be tailored. It has to be very specific for each and every program you're applying to. That's a top tip. All right. So we have here from Tyler Griggs. Uh, a busload of questions. Uh, I'm going to try to go through them all quickly. Uh, for the passport, can it be PDF? Yes. All documents should be PDF that you submit to University of Admissions in Sweden. I, I, the, uh, at least that used to be the case. Maybe they accept different formats these days, but PDF is the safest way to go. Scan to PDF and upload. Very simple. You can for most likely upload the J JPEGs as well, but that's fine. Yeah. So yeah. S stick to PDF is our recommendation. For the transcripts, how can we send an email to the university that we graduated from the original transcript? Well, I mean, you're not, you don't have to send an email to us. Uh, if that's what you're referring to, what you do need to do is take your transcripts, scan them, the original documents that you received from your university and upload to university admissions in Sweden. You should also, depending on where you, I don't know what country you graduate from, but if you have a degree certificate or similar, oh. Disappeared. <laughs> the question disappeared. Yeah, I think that, uh... Tyler is most likely from the US. So the, I think that he was probably referring to like, how do I contact my home university to send the transcripts? Oh. So I think that usually uh, universities in the US, they do have contacts for that specific purpose. Because if you're applying to another university within the US, you usually have to send your documents straight from one university to the other one. And that's the only reason why we have this requirement that we could have accepted scans from universities in the US but we can't because if you have this, this like requirement in the US that you send like official documents between universities, there must be a reason for that we figure. So you just contact them like you normally would if you were applying to another university within the US and ask them to send it to Sweden instead. But there is a specific uh, address that you should use and it's under the country specific requirements at the universityadmissions.se webpage. So you just contact your university and tell them to send your transcripts to that address. And don't make a very common mistake that people were doing uh, many years ago, that they included a specific note, like this is for Tyler, his application number is this, and they included that in the envelope. Please don't, we just need the transcripts. If there's any other documents that we are not normally seeing, we don't in fact know that it's sent straight from your university. So we just need the transcripts, they send it straight to the specific address and everything is fine and you will be okay, no worries. Right, so Karin is asking, I, I think we have more than 100 open questions, so, so we're going to be quick and efficient now, I hope. Hi, I have applied to two master's programs in Lund. I can imagine it's probably related to environment, sustainability, and possibly because they do require recommendation letters. And these uh, two environmental programs, environmental management and policy and environment and sustainability science, they do uh, require that. And they have specific uh, requirements for you um, if you are applying to both of these programs. So if you go to their website, 
uh, environmental sustainability science and also environmental management and policy. They will have specific information for people who do uh, choose to apply to both programs because they've gone bit back and forth. A couple of years ago, they required four letters to be sent. But then last year they said, no, if you're applying to both programs, just two letters are okay. What it is right now, I, I honestly don't know if they went back to uh, requiring four letters or not, but the information will be on their website, the program webpage. So Laura has a question here about like, <clears throat> if you're applying for um, the program now, you've got this decision in March, and I think we have a bit of a misunderstanding here because she's asking because um, we are also required to pay part of the tuition fee as part of application for the scholarship. How do I possible do this? That's not true, actually. You don't pay a part of the tuition fee. What you need to pay by the 1st of February is the application fee. That's not the tuition fee. The application fee is 900 Swedish crowns. It's not a massive amount. It's a small fee in order for us to process your study application there is no other like uh, cost involved with doing a scholarship application but you need to pay the application fee because if you did not there's no chance of you to be admitted so that's the difference you have to pay the application fee to have your application processed that's not the tuition fee the tuition fee is far later so if you get a scholarship you will most likely get a scholarship decision from the lund university global scholarship at the same day as you get your admission results so then you will know how much you would have to pay if any fees at all uh, so no no need to be worried the tuition fee is not the same as the application fee mm, so we have a question oh tim is answering that elisa sorry again hello i would like to know if i have different academic backgrounds but but i took online courses in the field of studies where i want to apply can the can these courses be considered as academic background elisa if they are genuine uh university courses where you've received or earned uh, university credits in the country where you studied, then yes, of course they can be used. But if it's just some kind of extra course or some school where they don't provide proper university credits, then those will not be counted uh, for your, uh, in order for you to fulfill the specific entry requirement. So it depends on what kind of school or university where you took these courses and what kind of actual credits you earned. I have a good question here. How long do we have to accept our place if we're admitted after March 30? That's a very good question. Uh, like normally, I mean, it depends on where you're from. I mean, if you're an EU, EUA citizen, I mean, obviously you have to tell us that you're coming. But then, I mean, since you don't have to pay a tuition fee, there's no like hard deadline. Uh, you just basically show up uh, when the program starts. But for other ones, like the, the students that are required to pay tuition fees, there will be a tuition fee deadline that you really have to reach. and the thing is, like, even if that might be quite far into the future, even after like you are admitted in March, what we highly recommend students to do nowadays is to pay as soon as possible. It's not because we need your money, guys. It's because you need to start making your residence permit application as soon as possible. Because the last couple of years, the residence permit application has taken longer and longer. So we highly recommend everyone to accept your place as soon as possible. And also, if you're able to pay as soon as possible so that there's more time for the migration agency to process your application. So we know for a fact that you will have plenty of time to arrive in Sweden to start your studies. Uh, but the official deadlines, I'm not sure if you have them on our website yet. I don't think we do, right? They will be updated at least within the couple, next couple of weeks. So just check our website page if you're interested, but you have plenty of time, no need to be worried. And we will keep you by the hand and lead you through this process so it will be as smooth as possible. So don't worry about that at the moment, that's in the future. <laughs> right, so moving on, Shamit Nirmal, Nirmal, sorry, should the transcript be sent by the university where we where the bachelor degree received, or can we send a copy by ourselves for Sri Lanka? Mention that. Well, uh, I can just send you the instructions for students coming from Sri Lanka in the chat here or in the Q and A, and you follow the instructions exactly as they are written. We don't have any additional instructions for students from Sri Lanka, so you need to follow the instructions that are provided by University Admissions in Sweden. I'm sending you uh, the instructions here. There's only one small exemption, and that is that there, in many countries, there might be American universities, like the American, American University of a certain city or something like that. If you do have these American universities, you need to, well, you know if you study at one of these universities, they, they teach you in English, they're called the American University of something. If you're studying at one of these, you need to make sure that the 
transcripts are sent straight from them because they are considered to be working under American law in most situations. So then it's a different subject, but otherwise just follow the normal country specific requirements and you will be fine. Mm. Uh, Damilola. Uh, so the SI scholarship opens for application on the 10th of February and closes later in February. And a major requirement to apply for the SI scholarship is having uh, admission. But the admission status will not be communicated on before 30th of March. Could you please clarify this? Right. So the, the application to the SI scholarship and your admission status at that point, there it doesn't matter. I mean, just first of all, you concentrate on making a complete application to a program. Then when you have made your application and submitted all documents, pay the application fee no later than February the 1st, in the middle of February, you can apply for the SI scholarship. Then what happens on March 30? you would be notified by us or through universal admissions if you have received an admission offer or not. But then you have to wait an additional couple of weeks. I don't know the the, the date yet, but it, it's usually by the end of March, uh, sorry, end of April, isn't it, Daniel, when SI uh, announced the scholarship winners. So you don't have to be admitted at the time of making the SI scholarship application. A really quick question here. From Natasha, I have dual citizenship with Sweden and the UK. Would I still be exempt from paying tuition fees? Yes, if you have a Swedish citizenship, you're fine. No need to be worried. As long as you see your passport or your personal identity number, you will not have to pay tuition fees. So that's quick and easy. Alabo is asking, my school in Nigeria needs a fiscal address to send my transcript to. They, they send only hard copy transcripts. Well, okay. So University Admissions in Sweden, they have information for this. It, it is possible to submit physical hard copies of uh, academic merits. So if you go to the University Admissions in Sweden website and, and look for information on how to submit documents, there will be an address, a physical address, where you can uh, send your documents to if you need to. So. Aslan here is asking, I've already completed my master's application on the portal. Do I need to dispatch any attested hard copies of my documents to the university? So this is a good question because you don't have to send documents to Lund University. Most situations you never have to do that. There are some exemptions. If you have like a poor portfolio, if you're doing like, a, let's say design or architecture or fine art, you might have to send the documents to the specific program. Otherwise, everything should be sent to the university admissions. So you need to check the country specific requirements and follow them strictly and you should be fine with your application as well. Uh, we have a message from Grace from Ghana. Uh, Grace from Ghana, a bachelor's degree holder in communication studies journalism at Ghana Institute of Journalism. Please, how can I apply your university to do my master's in journalism? Well, you, Grace, first of all, you need to find uh, one or more programs that we offer that are uh, relevant for your previous degree. I would say probably media and communication studies would be uh, an advice for me, uh, considering your background. But you need to make sure that you fulfill the actual entry requirements of the program or programs that you're applying to. But please go to our website and check the programs that we have and find one or more programs that are interesting and relevant for you, uh, considering what you want to do and your uh, study merits, of course, your academic background, and then you make your application. So the deadline for this is January 16. So Emmanuel is asking, I've paid application fees, also uploaded supporting documents, but I've received two email reminders about these tasks. Does it imply my supporting documents are not intact? So this is an interesting question. Like, um, it depends. I mean, you probably have nothing to worry about because we do send like generic emails to all students. And when we get the list of students that have made an application, we are not able from those lists to see if you have provided the supporting documents yet. Sometimes we can see if a student has paid the application fee or not, but we, we can't see if you uploaded any supporting documents. So there's most likely no reason to be worried. And there's usually something stated in these emails that says like, if applicable, like pay the application fee before 1st of February, if applicable, or if not already completed. Uh, but we are sending these like mass emails to all applicants to, to let you know what you have to do. But if you already completed it, there's no need to be worried. I mean, we're just sending a reminder to everyone. So yeah, you can chill. Mm. 
<laughs> so here's a question. Uh, what is the refund policy like? I, I'm, I'm assuming the tuition fee refund policy if the visa is rejected. Well, uh, that is a good question. It, it, we will refund your uh, tuition fee in full if, if your uh, residence permit application is rejected uh, next year. Uh, we hope that won't happen, of course, but it can happen. Um, and when it happens, you can just ask for a tuition fee refund and we will process that request. So do, you're not, we're not going to keep your money unless you can actually come here and join us physically. And Nicholas is asking, can the TOEFL test be submitted by February 1st and must the proof of English be submitted by January 16th? 1st of February it is. So as long as you've made your application by 16th of January, you have until the 1st to send these documents. No worries. Um, so here we have a question. Uh, oh, sorry, it disappeared. Uh, Malita, I have done all first cycle degree and postgraduate diploma in English. For the English proficiency, do I have to upload all the transcripts? Um, uh, let me see here. Yes, you do have to upload all your transcript. Uh, and specifically, uh, you know, if you want to prove your English proficiency through previous merits, previous university merits, all those merits have to be provided in the way that is uh, described by university admissions in Sweden for the country where you studied previously. There's a question here. <clears throat> I'm Grace from Ghana and all my studies are done in English. Do I still have to prove my English proficiency and can you please send me the application link of journalism? So basically, like if you studied your complete degree in English language, that's usually uh, means that you are can able, well, you can use your, well, your transcripts in order to prove your English proficiency. However, I highly encourage you to read like the fine print of the university admissions website to make sure that everything's fine because it needs to be stated on your transcripts that you studied in English language. But for some countries, that's not the case. As long as you have a degree from a specific country, uh, we can assume that you studied in English as well. But read the fine print on the universityadmissions.se webpage and you'll be fine with that one. Um, send me the link to journalists. We don't actually have a journalist program. We have a media and communications program instead. There's a strategic communications program as well. So you might want to go to our university webpage and just look through our webpage and see if you can find what you're looking for. A lot of journalists are studying media and communications, so you're more than welcome to have a look at that program. All right, so moving on. Majid, I am originally from Iran, but I'm in Sweden with my wife. I have recently moved here, so I have no personal number whereas I applied for it and I have no bank account, could you please help me how I can pay the application fee? Well, Majid, if you are, if you have to pay an application fee, it's either through a bank transfer or using a Visa or MasterCard. Uh, so you have to figure out how to pay that either by yourself or through some friend who is able to do it because you have to pay, but it doesn't have to be from you. <laughs> I mean, just as long as your application fee is paid, uh, find someone with a bank account and or Visa MasterCard to pay that for you if you are fee liable. Oops. Vanessa O'Hara. Hello, I'm from an English speaking country. English is my native language and I studied my bachelor's degree in English. Do I still need to prove my English proficiency? Well, you still need to prove your English proficiency, but most likely if you are from an English speaking country and you studied completely in English, that should be enough to prove your English language proficiency. That is to say, there is most likely not a need for you to take an English test. I found a question here that's probably relevant to a lot of students. If I'm applying for a master's program, which has a requirement of a minimum credit in a certain area, can the course I have completed during my master's degree studies, which I'm currently enrolled in with my country, uh, can they be counted as well if I submit the transcript? Or is the university looking solely at my bachelor's to determine if I have enough credits in a certain area? That's a very good question, actually, because Yes, you can use both your transcripts to prove to us that you're eligible. It's quite common within science, for instance, that we have bachelor students that have studied the same mathematics, but they don't have enough uh, calculus in some sort of area that are required to do a master's here. But if you've done a similar like master's at your home university where you have studied enough credits in that specific area, that would actually make you eligible for that specific program. So yes, with the help of two transcripts, two different university degrees, you can make yourself eligible for our programs. So you should submit both of these transcripts and yeah, it should work. Right, so Anne Rhodes um, is asking a similar question that we had before that you, you've studied in English, 
Uh, my degree was taught in English, and I read uh, that if your degree program was taught completely in English, that's enough to prove your English language proficiency. Um, that is true, but you still have to fulfill the actual requirement that is described by University of Michigan Sweden on their website, because they have slightly different requirements depending on where you earned your previous degree. If it was from a university in the European Union and or in an English speaking country like Australia, the United States or uh, the UK, for instance, that's enough. But if you earned your degree from a country where English is not the first or even uh, official language at all, but you studied in English, then it has to be uh, clearly printed on your tra official transcripts and or your degree certificate that you studied a program that was taught completely in English. We have a question here from Nathalie, who's asking, I have a temporary resident permit and a work visa. Will I still have to pay tuition? So the fact of the matter is like, if you have a residence permit in Sweden based on something that is not studies at the moment, no, as a matter of fact, you don't have to pay tuition fees. You don't even have to pay the application fee. However, if your status changes, you will end up being a resident, well, basically a tuition fee uh, paying. So, but if you are able to study a program while still continuing working, you could, I guess, <laughs> theoretically, Study for free. You don't have to pay tuition fees. If you have your work visa and you will keep that during your studies, you can study without having to pay for your um, um, yeah, education. Saskia is asking, hello, I'm applying for master for September 2023 and take reapplication I tried last year. I'm not re receiving an answer from the program. Uh, I sent a couple of emails. Uh, where can I send an email to have an answer for my admission requirement, credit requirement for masters? Thank you. Well, Saskia, as we have said uh, previously here, it can be difficult for uh, students to, to try to figure out if they're eligible, if they have enough credits in this or that subject, or uh, maybe your the name of your degree is not exactly the name as the degree we are asking for. Um, and sometimes the programs can help you with that. Sometimes they they won't because they have too much work to do, and they think that uh, I will only we will only process the application once it has been formally made. So they won't pre-assess students' merits um, before they make a formal application. So I'm afraid you're going to have to be patient and wait for the guys at uh, master at sam.lu.se to potentially uh, provide an answer to you. Or you have to go ahead and just make your application and send in all the documents. And then they will obviously process your application and assess your merits and tell you if you are eligible or not. But there is no, we can't offer to do this to all potential students. Uh, it's just too much work. There's a question here from Shodan. For scholarship students, does it is it mandatory to demonstrate that they have enough money in their bank accounts? So, I mean, if you have the Lund University Global Scholarship and you don't, let's say that you get like a hundred percent, so you don't have to pay the tuition fee, yes, you would still have to show that you have enough money to survive, that you can uh, live in Sweden. So that's still a requirement for scholarship recipients. However, if you do get the Swedish Institute scholarship, you would not have to do that because the Swedish Institute will cover both the tuition fee and the living cost, and they will provide you with a document that tells the migration agency that they will pay for your living costs and they will definitely accept that. No worries. Then you don't have to show any money in a bank account. But for the Lund University Global Scholarship, yes, you would have to prove that you can still pay your living costs in Sweden on your own. Right. So here's a question from Goda. Is any help provided for student accommodation? Well, the short answer, I don't want to get into too much detail about this because it can take a, a whole webinar just to talk about uh, student accommodation. Uh, but if you are a fee liable non-EU student, you have to pay tuition fees to study in Lund. You will, uh, and you're admitted uh, on March 30, you will have a so-called housing guarantee. So then you can get a housing offer if you apply when we tell you to apply, et cetera, and follow the um instructions that we hand out then if you are eu eea or not fee liable you study free of charge in learn then a, a, a housing offer is not guaranteed so that's the quick answer does Lund university have a support team staff to help prospective students through the application system <laughs> yes we do that's kind of what we're doing here i mean <laughs> so yes we do i mean if you have any questions you're more than welcome to send us an email and there's even like a contact form on the website if you go to like admissions 
just contact us and you can just fill out that form and our colleagues will direct you to the correct person that will help you with whatever questions you might have. So just get in contact with us and we will help you, no worries. Thank you. Uh, Goda, is the tuition fee to be paid during offer acceptance? Uh, Goda, yes, there is a, I mean, first you will get your admission offer from Learned, which happens on March the 30th, uh, March 30. So then we will send out, start sending out the tuition fee invoices sometime in, I guess, early to mid-April. Uh, I don't have an exact date for this yet, but early to mid-April, you get your tuition fee invoice. And this has to be paid usually before May 20. So regardless if you're paying out of your own pocket or if some kind of scholarship situation, you must be able to settle the first tuition fee invoice no later than May 20. But I want to say that the exact date for, for next year has not been decided yet. So, but I think we're going to stick to the same date. So probably May 20, uh, you have to settle the first invoice before that. So we have Daniel? a question here. Yeah, we have a question here from Sarah, who's made her mechanical engineering degree at a university in Palestine. Uh, I'm genuinely interested in pursuing my master's degree in energy efficient environmental building design. Uh, how could I know if I qualify for this specific program? Also, when submitting the required documents on the portal, can I just attach scans of the official transcript and diploma? This is a very interesting question, actually. For me, uh, this is a very exotic question because I haven't actually replied to students uh, from this region of the world before. So I guess that what you need to do is you need to contact the program uh, directly and you if you have a scan of your like transcript you can send it to them and ask them like would I be eligible. I think that you could because they have like an engineering um, requirement but it might depend on like what courses you have studied in that specific program that you're studying at the moment. Um, and if you can scan your documents, you need to check if there's country specific requirements for your home country to make sure that if you need to send them like in a, like, like a normal postal document, like a formal document, or if you can just upload them. So you need to check that on the university admissions of the webpage. In other words, just contact the program. They will be happy to reply to you if you're eligible or not. Mm, I just checked actually university admissions and, and students who with the transcript from Palestine it's it appears as if they can scan their original documents and submit them just like uh, most other students around the world wonderful yeah uh Raymond is asking if the master program requires 120 credits can it be taken in one year only now 120 university credits it, it will take two years to complete that you can't you can't study you know double double speed um as it were you you have to stay if it's a full program 120 ECTS, it, it's going to take two years. And the reason for that is not that, I mean, even if you're very talented, you might think that you would be able to do this. Like I could easily study twice the speed. So the fact of the matter is that many of our program courses within our two year long programs are building on, on top of each other. So even if they are given at the exact same time, Yes, you, but you still can't take like this one of these courses because you need to complete level one before you can take level two. So um, they are like building on top of each other. So that's one of the reasons why it would be technically impossible to do it. Even if you're very, very talented, you just can't because of the structure of the program. Olawale is asking, can someone with a third class in bachelor's degree and with more than five years working experience apply for a master's program at Lund University. Although while it depends on uh, the specifics concerning the country where you studied previously. Um, so you're going to have to check the country specific information on the University of Missions in Sweden website. You don't mention where you studied previously, uh, what country that is, but you're going to need to go to that website, uh, University of Missions in Sweden country instructions for the country where you studied previously and find out if you uh, fulfill the requirements or not for master's level studies in Sweden. I found an interesting question here. Would I be penalized if I decided not to write a bachelor thesis? So a bachelor thesis is not necessarily a requirement for all of our programs. I mean, we know that in some countries it's not necessary, but for some of our programs here at Lund University, it is a strict requirement that you need to have written a bachelor thesis or some other academic work that we can consider when doing our assessment of your application. That's usually for 
I would say like language programs and similar uh, subjects. So it might be a requirement that you have a bachelor thesis or some other academic work that you can show us. So you might have to check that with this program specific um, well coordinator because I, I can't answer this like straight up. But in many cases, if you don't have a bachelor thesis, that's not a problem because most programs just require that you have a bachelor degree. If you need a thesis or not, it's not necessary. But for some, it's very, very uh, necessary. Right. So John Nkuo is asking, my name is John. My first degree is civil engineering. I've worked 20 years, ICT as consultant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you want to know if you're eligible to apply for supply chain and management. Um, well, John, as with all our programs, they have specific entry requirements. So if you go to the program that you're interested in and check the entry requirements of that program and read the requirements, you, you have to meet them in full. That is to say, if your degree uh, is not relevant for that particular program, then you're not eligible, regardless of your professional experience. But if you if you look at the entry requirements and see, oh yes, I have this exact background, then go ahead and make an application. Oh, no, it's appeared here. But yeah, so we had a question here that was basically like, should I pay separately the application fee for every application? No, it's just one application fee. So you can apply for up to four different programs, but it's just one application fee. It's 900 Swedish crowns for the full application. So you only pay once. So um, uh, I do apologize if we were not clear on that one, but you just pay once. Yeah. Uh, John Adamai is asking, do we need a bank account if we have a re if we have relative someone to sponsor us who is a Swedish resident? Um, I don't know what you mean by sponsor. Uh, the Who pays the application fee if you're fee liable? Uh, it doesn't matter. But when you apply for a residence permit in Sweden, you must have funding uh, for yourself in your personal bank account, then you, it can't be some other person who would kind of guarantee uh, your living expenses. The living expenses needed to get a residence permit, you have to have it in your own personal bank account. There's a question, are students from English speaking countries required to take English proficiency tests? And usually no. I mean, as long as you have uh, studied in that country and you have some proofs that you have either upper secondary education or a bachelor's from that specific country, you should be fine. You don't have to take a formal test. However, there's one exception. If you're applying for English language programs at Lund University, no matter if you're from the US or from the UK, you will have to take the IELTS test because you need to show that you are very, very proficient, but that's way over the normal like proficiency level of English language, but otherwise you should be fine. Mm. Ola Lekan is asking, what happens when we are unable to pay the tuition fee at, at tw uh, as at 20 April when we wait for the SI scholarship? Well, uh, Ola Lekan, there is no requirement to pay the first tuition fee invoice before uh, the Swedish Institute scholarship is uh, announced, when they announce uh, their recipients. So you don't have to worry about that uh, currently. So after that, you find out if you have received the SI scholarship or not. Um, then we'll handle, you don't have to actually pay the invoice, the, the Swedish Institute will do that on your behalf. Uh, and if you don't get the Swedish Institute scholarship, you can notify us and say, sorry, I didn't get the scholarship, I'm dropping out. But you don't have to pay the tuition fee before they announce the scholarship recipients. And another scholarship question, Thomas is asking, if I apply for more than one scholarship, one full scholarship and the other partial, and I get both, what do I do? So, I mean, if you're applying for both like the Swedish Institute and the Lund University Global Scholarship, let's be frank and honest here. I mean, if you get the Lund University Global Scholarship when you're actually admitted, that's perfect. You just accept that and you're happy and move on with your life and try to make all the funding arrangements. If you later get the Swedish Institute one, obviously that's so much better. You just let us know. We will also be informed by the Swedish Institute, obviously, and we will instantly retract our offer of a Lund University Global Scholarship and give that to someone else, because you should definitely take the Swedish Institute one instead, because they will pay for everything for you. Right. So Foster is asking, uh, I want to know, after the application, are we supposed to pay all the fees and the way for acquiring visa? What are the courses for ESA scholarship? Well, first of all, when you get the admission offer, uh, that is March 30. And then you have until probably May 20 to pay the first tuition fee invoice. And you cannot apply for a residence permit to Sweden uh, before you have settled the first tuition fee. 
um, some in some way. Either you pay through your own pocket or if there is a scholarship, but it has to be settled no later than May 20. And then you can go ahead and make your residence permit application. The, the sooner you can do this, the better. What are the courses for easy scholarship? There, we don't have a course for an easy scholarship. There, there, there is no way to easily get a scholarship. What you need to focus on is making a very strong application to uh, one program or more than one program at Lund University. Uh, and then perhaps we can consider you for a scholarship, but there is no one easy way. So we have a question here. My bachelor's in Sweden are full in English. Is that enough to prove my English language requirements for master's in Lund? As a matter of fact, yes, it is. Even if you studied at any European university, as long as you studied in English language, you will be fine. Mm. That's right. Or EU, actually. EU, EEA. Uh, Mariam is asking, do I have to upload all the documents, passport, English, etc., for each different application? Mariam, no. So the official documents, that is your 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 university documents, your transcripts, degree certificate, the passport, proof of English, they just have to be uh, uploaded once. But if there are, if you're applying to many different programs, they may individually have specific requirements for your document that could be a statement of purpose or a CV. So if that's the case, then you need those documents, the program specific documents have to be provided for each and every program, but not your so-called official documents. I have a question here from Elisa asking, am I required to send reference letters from my employees and uh, employers, I guess, instead of professors? So the fact of the matter is that some programs do require recommendation or reference letters. And sometimes they need to be academic or they might be from your work experience. Sometimes they need both. So it depends. So I know that like for the Swedish Institute scholarship, they need to show you, well, you need to show that you have like a reference that you have actually been working before. So then you need to have reference letters from uh, from your work life in general. Uh, so it depends. So you need to double check with the program specific requirements. And if you're applying for a scholarship, you need to check the requirements for that. But yes, yeah, sometimes you need to send both actually. So it could be good to know. Right, so Fanny is asking, do you think European studies generally is considered a degree in social sciences or humanities? I would tend to say yes, but I still want to take this chat as an opportunity to check with you. Well, yes, of course it is. I would say one leg in each world, one leg in humanities and social science. But if I'm not mistaken, this particular program is offered at the Faculty of Humanities. So possibly it's a bit more humanities than social sciences, but um, inevitably you are gonna get a bit of both inside of this program. There's a question here, if a non-EU applicant is living in Sweden, they don't have to pay tuition fees. It all depends on the residence permit you have in Sweden. So if you have a residence permit in Sweden for any reason, I mean, if you're very young, you might have residence permit because your family is living here like your parents are living here. And then if you have residence permit based on anything else in studies, then you don't have to pay tuition fees while you have that residence permit status. So if that changes, your status might change, but otherwise, no, if you're living here for other reasons, you can study for free. Mm. Siham is asking, how much is the application fee? The application fee is 900 Swedish krona, which is around 80 to 85 euros or similar in US dollars. Um, and you pay this, uh, it's a flat fee. Uh, it doesn't cost more to apply for more programs, uh, but it has to be paid if you're uh, uh, liable to pay this uh, fee. 900 Swedish krona. And there's an interesting question about scholarships. So will the SI scholarship also cover programs that requires 120 ECT? It's a two year long program. Yes, they will. And it's the same with the Lund University Global Scholarship. I guess that the thing that makes some students confused is that we usually talk about the first year when we send out all documents and also on our webpage. But I mean, it's the same with the Swedish Institute. They will cover the full length of the program. It's just that we will be giving out the scholarship one year at a time. And then we will double check and make sure that you're actually studying, that you're doing well, that everything's fine. And then we will continue giving you a scholarship for the second year. And that's automatic, nothing to worry about. So you will be fine. All right, so Noah is asking, I'm applying for a master's program in physics with two different specializations. Can I merge the specifications into one summary sheet? Both spe specializations require only the summary sheet. Noah, generally speaking, I would advise you to provide one summary sheet per program, even if they are similar, uh, of course, uh, but they are two different programs and maybe two different um, 
uh, staff members at Loon will assess depending on the specialization. So please do provide one summary sheet per program. A very interesting question here. Do you have any incubation centers or accelerators for uh, new startups at Lund University for promoting entrepreneurship? And this is very interesting because this region is usually called uh, the Greater Copenhagen region. I mean, we're close to Denmark and Copenhagen is the capital of Denmark. The reason why it's called this is because I guess we could name Stockholm the capital of uh, <clears throat> Scandinavia. But the fact of the matter is like this region is considered to be one of the most innovative in the world. And we have several incubation centers here at Lund University. We have something called Ideon, which is basically that all they do. Uh, so if you go to our website and you look for, you can just look for innovation, uh, you will find uh, links to these incubation centers. So a lot of our students uh, can actually start their own programs, or well, not some programs, sorry, their own companies while here in Sweden. And if you have a great business idea, there will be options to find both funding office spaces and everything you might need. It's quite common actually that a few students every year start their own companies here. So we have a lot of startups and you should look for Ideon here in Lund and you will find more information. Right, so quickly now, Aishwarya P. Hi, thanks for the informative session. I'm an international student. Can you please let me know if I could request an application fee waiver? Uh, Aishwarya and everyone else, I'm sorry to say we are not in a position to uh, be able to offer application fee waivers. All students who are fee liable must be able to pay the application fee themselves. Tyler, I remember Tyler, uh, his, uh, uh, this person's question actually disappeared when I tried to answer it. So uh, I'm going to get back to you now, Tyler. I hope you're still with us. For the passport, can it be PDF? Yes, it can. For the transcripts, how can we send an email to the university that graduated from the original transcripts? I think Daniel covered that. It depends on where you, you're saying that you're an American who is currently living in the United Kingdom. So you have to follow the country specific information for where you earned your previous degree. If you studied previously in the United States, you have to follow the instructions for students uh, from the United States. If you're studying now in the UK, uh, you have to follow the instructions for the UK. Um, would I need a letter of recommendation from my professor? How can I send an email to him, my professor, for him to put onto my application form? Well, Tyler, it depends on the program that you're applying to, program or programs. Most of our programs, I would say, do not want uh, or need a letter of recommendation to be sent together with your application. But if you are applying to a program that where they do need to see a letter of recommendation, you need to follow the instructions for that particular program. And all our programs have different instructions here. So it's kind of hard to give a general answer. Um, questions from my parents about the financial paperwork for the application on behalf of our son, Tyler Griggs, who's in the UK at the moment, filling out the application forms for Lund University. How would you like our son to submit the financial information? Uh, you don't need to submit any financial information together with your application. What you do need to do is A, pay the application fee if you are application fee liable, and B, later on, once you have received an admission offer, hopefully, you're going to need to pay the uh, tuition fee and also apply for a residence permit to stay in Sweden. And when you do apply for a residence permit, your financial information would be part of the application to the Swedish Migration Agency for the residence permit. So that is not a requirement from Lund University. We don't need to see your financial information, but you do need to show this when you apply for a residence permit and not before. Um, so I hope that covers most of your questions. We have a question here about from Uganda, from uh, Joseph. Is it acceptable to share accommodation? And as a matter of fact, we do have, I mean, our own accommodation agency. They do offer shared accommodation as well. So yes, it's quite common in order to reduce the cost that students are living together. And we also provide uh, certain apartments and certain um, buildings where students can choose to live with other students in order to reduce their costs. So yeah, that's a way of living and studying in Sweden as well. So you can do that. All right. Um, Huang Nguyen, for the Lund Scholarship, especially data analytics, uh, do we focus on work experience rather than academic merits? I have six years uh, experience as a data analyst with strong work performance, but my bachelor's GPA is not so high but I graduated six years ago. I don't have a second chance of fixing the GPA. No, that's true. I mean, Juan, 
uh, your GPA is your GPA. Uh, but I just checked the data analytics and business economics program uh, selection criteria, and they base their uh, selection on academic merits. So that's just uh, the way it works. It's it's always good to have relevant work experience, but it can usually not be used in place of uh, the correct academic merits or academic experience. So you're just going to have to work with what you have and make your application and perhaps in your your uh, scholarship application letter, you explain your situation and uh, perhaps they may take this into consideration. We actually have a very good question here from Karina. Uh, hi there, thanks for the presentation. I have a transfer credits in my bachelor diploma. They only appear as a total number on the official transcript. There's no breakdown. Will this be a problem? Thanks in advance. So there are different ways they can show like the, 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 the transcripts, like they can show if you have transfer credits. If there is only like one bunch, like yes, student A did, let's say exchange studies or transferred 60 credits uh, to be included in this specific bachelor's degree, that might actually be a problem because then you need to provide us with a transcript from the other university as well because we need to see what specific courses you have studied. In other cases, there might be the option that they have highlighted exactly what credits you uh, you have transferred and then you might not need this. Still, I would say, I highly encourage everyone that has transferred between different universities during their bachelor's or master's or whatever you've studied before, include transcripts from both universities. You can easily get them and it just reduces the confusion for everyone involved. So get those as soon as possible. So get make sure that you send transcripts from both of your uh, institutions. Um, I think that's correct for you, one, right? Yeah, exactly correct. And also that applies to students who have done an exchange. Um, if you did an exchange as part of your bachelor's, it's always best and recommended to to provide the exchange transcript as well. And you should have this. I mean, this is something that all exchange students should receive from the, the host university when they finish their studies there. Um, Atsega is asking, can my statement of purpose cover all other schools I have applied to in Sweden? No, it cannot. Uh, the statement of purpose is strictly for the for one program at a time. So if you're applying to four programs, you're going to need to provide four statements of purpose if all of them require this document. There's another question about the scholarships. I Do I have to apply for admission and then the scholarship application or should I apply to them both at the same time? So basically, in order to be eligible to apply for a scholarship, you need to have completed your application for a program. So you have to start with finding the program you would like to study, complete your application for that, then we will invite you to apply for the scholarship. Uh, so you can't start with a scholarship application, you can't do them at the same time. They will be running at the same time, but you have to start by applying for a specific program. That's right. Miroslava, hello, thank you for the lecture. I have a question regarding ID passport. I am a EU citizen. Um, I should. Uh, I need to prove that I'm a EU citizen. I have uploaded a passport, but the program still shows me that I need to pay tuition fee. What should I do? Well, Miroslava, if you have uh, actually uploaded your passport, eventually the admission officers at the University of Admissions in Sweden will go in and will check your application, and they will uh, they will uh, note that you are fee exempt. But most likely, they haven't checked your application yet, and and all their their you know, attitude is that all students are fee liable until they prove that they are not. So when they go in and check your application, they will make a note saying that you are fee exempt if you are an EU citizen. I have a really quick one here. If we fail to be accepted into Lund University this year, can we reapply to the next year with the same program? And yes, you can, as a matter of fact, I mean, you can be admitted next year. I mean, it's all about the competition in a specific year. You might be reserved this year, but you can get in the next year. And it's the same with the scholarship program. Like if you're applying and you're getting into the program of your dreams and you can't fund that this year, that will not be a problem if you're applying next year. I mean, we, we don't really care about that. I mean, you can apply. I know that a lot of students that get the Swedish Institute scholarship Sometimes they are not able to get it the first or even the second year they're applying, but they might get it the third year when they have enough uh, work experience and when they reach a certain level that the Swedish Institute, for instance, would yeah, require. Uh, and we don't care about that. Yes, you can apply multiple years and you will be able to get in sooner or later if you're competitive enough. So no worries. Mm. 
Manuela is asking, uh, thank you for your time. My question is, I applied for a master's degree in biochemistry, but the program has no specific requirements. Well, that's not entirely true. They do. You need a bachelor's degree of at least 180 credits, including 90 in chemistry, of which 15 must be in biochemistry. Um, but the selection criteria for this program, you want to know perhaps how they select their candidates. They say it's based on grades awarded for previous academic courses in science, engineering, and mathematics. So this, that's the selection criteria for biochemistry. There's a question from Lydia. Do I need to provide financial information when applying for a scholarship, and if it, even if I have been offered a scholarship? So no, for our scholarships here in Sweden, we don't need to see financial information. We, we don't really care about your financial situation. Uh, the Lund University Global Scholarship is completely merit-based. And the Swedish Institute, the Swedish Institute for Global Professionals, they're looking for, I think they call them like future leaders or future global professionals. So they have a different mindset as well. Uh, we don't, they're not need-based, so to speak. I mean, we are looking for really talented people that we think can drive change in the world and make good. So um, no, you don't need to provide us with any financial information when applying for a scholarship. All right. Shu Wu is asking, I have a semester of exchange studies in Loon. Do I need to submit the transcript of that semester? Would it be beneficial if I submitted? Well, it should already be available to us in the application system if you're if, if I'm not completely mistaken. But if you would like to, you know, you have your transcript, scan it and upload it. It doesn't, you know, uh, take much effort. So I would do that if I were you. Um, it's always good to see that students have experience from Loon and we can see your grades, et cetera, the courses could be very relevant. So I have a question here from Kingsley from Ghana, and it's centered about the application fees uh, and the fact that it might be tricky to pay the application fees if you're from certain parts of the world. And uh, yeah, we're sad to say that we, we do understand that it's, it is tricky and complicated. We do acknowledge and know that, I mean, 900 Swedish crowns is a lot of money for certain parts of the world. Um, the problem with it is that unfortunately we are not allowed, by Swedish law, we're not allowed to waive the tuition fee. And I know that has been a discussion in Sweden for a long time that maybe there should be uh, specific fees for specific parts or regions of the world, but that's not what the law entails at the moment. So there is actually no way for us to waive um, an application fee. So you will have to find a way to pay the application fee. That's the only way it is, I'm sorry to tell you. Um, but yeah, it's the same for everyone in the world. All right. Gerald Henry is asking, can I stay in Sweden and work remotely in my home country? Uh, I don't know. It depends on your home country, I suppose. Uh, what you do in your free time here in Sweden, uh, if you need to sit in front of your computer and do some work remotely, that is, as far as I know, it, totally fine. Uh, Ravinder Singh Rathor is asking, can a gap of seven years be accepted? I had my work experience of seven years. Yes, there is nothing saying that you couldn't, couldn't apply even if you have been working for many years. You can be as old as you want to, you can still apply. We're not allowed to discriminate against that at all. Some programs though would prefer, I guess, to get like fresh students in uh, for the masters. But not all of them, but I mean, you can still apply. I mean, there's still a chance of getting admission. There is no, we are not allowed to discriminate. So you should be fine. Right. Uh, so I think it's actually 10 past 12 now. We have yeah. uh, we have been talking here for a bit more than two hours. We were supposed to close, but there are so many questions. I don't think we can possibly go through them all uh, unless we, we, we would need an additional hour or two to go through them all. And I'm afraid we do not have that time today. So I apologize to all those who have not uh, been able to receive a, a, an answer to their question. But I, I scanned the question and I saw that many of them we have actually handled in one form or another. Uh, so I hope that's OK. Uh, but I think we need to close here for today because we have more sessions also in the afternoon uh, for bachelor's applicants, maybe not relevant for you here right now. but. Um, we need to handle those sessions as well. So I would like to thank everyone who joined us here today. I hope you received some valuable information. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, also, I mean, if, if you feel that you did not get your question answered, I mean, you're more than welcome to contact us through the web page. There is a web form. And I know that some people hate web forms. I'm one of them myself, but it's the easiest way for us to get your um, requests into our mailboxes. So just use that form. We will reply usually within 24 hours or 48 hours at least. 
So just send your questions. If you feel that you have a question that you really want answered, just send it to us. And uh, the reason why it might, might take a bit longer is because we are also like traveling, but also because we sort all incoming messages to the correct officer that has like knowledge about your region. And that also takes a little bit longer, but you will get a reply. So just contact us and we will be happy to help you guys. Great. So thanks for joining us today again, uh, and we wish you the best of luck with your application to Lund University, and I hope to see you here next year. Yeah, good luck, guys, and take care.